Okay, merci beaucoup, Paul. Uh, très plaisir d'être ici. Uh, je vais parler en anglais, mais je peux répondre à des, que des questions en français. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about today is this, um, what we've learned from simulations of something called common envelope evolution uh, of stars. So, when two, when one big star engulfs uh, a smaller star and they spiral in together in the envelope of that large inflated star, uh, what happens in that process? Um, and we've basically used uh, 3D global simulations to investigate that. And this is the work that I've been doing uh, with uh, collaborating with people from University of Rochester and Rochester Institute of Technology in New York. And um, just a list of the of all the collaborators uh, here below. So um, just to explain what um, this, how this process works. So you basically have this giant star, uh, it could be a red giant or an asymptotic giant branch star, and it engulfs this, and this is just a cartoon of course, but it engulfs this companion in a binary system. And then they inspiral together uh, towards one another. And this happens, you know, obviously much slower than, um, you know, there, there's many, many orbits before they in, they in spiral so that they're very, very close together, um, but it's still relatively rapid. Okay, so it, it, it could be, and we'll see, and in, in the simulations, we can try to estimate how long this process actually takes, but it's so rapid that it's hard to see it just uh, with a telescope, you know, you have to be lucky enough to see such an event and you have to survey, you have to, rely on these large surveys to catch these events happening uh, because they're quite quick. So the reason that they inspiral is because of friction, right? So they lose their orbital energy and angular momentum. And these cores, right? So you've got the companion here, which is a much smaller star. It could be a main sequence star. It could be a white dwarf, neutron star, black hole. And it will, and then you've got here, this is also a very dense core it's a dense core of the giant star. So basically a proto white dwarf. Um, these, gi these giant stars have very inflated envelopes. They're not like main sequence stars, but there's a very large um, change in density as you go from the core to the envelope. And they will, the, it's the kind of friction, it's not your typical hydrodynamic drag, but it's uh, dynamical friction. So it's because of gravity that this happens. And I'll, I'll explain it a bit better uh, later in the talk. And then this liberated orbital energy and angular momentum are transferred, they're transferred to the envelope. And this continues until either the companion and core merge, which happens in some cases. And, uh, you know, uh, that's interesting, but that's sort of one class of observational uh, objects that might arise from that. Or the alternative is that enough of energy and angular momentum are transferred to the envelope that the envelope actually gets ejected. And that's sort of the, the case that we tend to be more interested in. We definitely see a lot of observational evidence for this because we see these binary systems that are very, very in a very, very tight orbit. And there's really no other way that they could have uh, gotten into that orbit. Uh, so you need the common envelope to explain a lot of these, what are called, they're actually called in the, in the observational literature, Post common envelope binaries, just because they're so close together. And you know, if you have a white dwarf, you know it comes from a giant star. But if the binary separation is smaller than the ra radius of the original giant star, you know something must have happened to bring them into a very tight orbit. Okay, so in terms of the observations, um, there's other observational motivation as well. So in terms of actually catching these processes as they happen. There's something called luminous red novae. They're also called intermediate luminosity optical transients. Actually, they have many names because we don't understand them very well yet. And so we, you know, they're probably all part of the same general phenomena, um, but it's, they're not yet fully, they've not yet fully been properly classified. Um, some people think that these are what we see when the two, the two cores merge. Um, other people think that maybe we see this sort of thing even when they don't merge, but when, whenever we have a common envelope event happening. Common envelopes are also important for the progenitors, right? I say progenitors because inside this object, this planetary nebula, 
um, you don't we, we don't have a common envelope phase happening right now, but in the past it did happen. And in this particular one, you actually see a binary uh, star at the center that's left over, a tight binary. Um, but any planetary nebula that has this sort of bipolar morph morphology, there probably was a common envelope phase at some point in its evolution. And then you have gravitational wave sources. Again, they have to get close enough to be able to merge to neutron stars, to black holes, et cetera, or to white dwarfs, although we can't see that yet with gravitational waves. And um, you might think, well, but don't they merge because of gravitational wave radiation? And that is true, but for, they have, that's a very slow process. And for them to be able to merge within the age of the universe, within a Hubble time, they need to, first of all, get close enough that gravitational waves can take over and dominate the in-spiral. And for that, you need, a, you need a common envelope event. Or there's other possibilities, but common envelopes are probably the most common way to do that. And then even uh, some types of supernovae, including supernovae type 1A, um, have in their histories uh, common envelope events, sometimes more than one, we believe. Okay, so some questions one can ask about this uh, phenomenon. What is the final orbital separation after envelope ejection as a function of the binary parameters? What is the duration of the common envelope stage? Does it last for a thousand years, one year? Uh, we don't really know because Observationally, there are no very firm constraints on the time scale. We know it's fast, but you know, faster than you know, shorter than the life of a planetary nebula, for instance, instance, but that's something like 10,000 years or so we don't have very stringent constraints. And in general, we want to you know map out the time evolution of the process. And then what physics is dynamically important and under what circumstances? So there could be many different um, contributions. Uh, but I'll get into that only slightly later in the talk because the, for lack of time, but people have, and including us, have studied uh, different physics. And just a comment that it's not possible to map out all the parameter space using global 3D simulations. So we need models. So this is just, I mean, this may be obvious to some of you, but um, just that point that, you know, every, everything can be these big, huge simulations. I mean, they're useful, but they have their limitations. And in the end, we want to understand what's going on. We don't want to just reproduce, reproduce it with big computers. We want to actually understand. So we do the simulations, but we're always thinking in the back of our minds, okay, what is this really saying? Is there a simpler way to model this? And you know, we need to, these, these people are interested in modeling thousands of these systems at a time, so-called population synthesis of binary systems. To, for example, predict the event rates of these uh, gravitational wave sources. And so to do that, there's no way you're going to use, you're going to do thousands of simulations. You need better models. And so that's a bit of the holy grail is to develop a simple model that can predict um, the outcome of common envelope from the parameters. Okay, so some strat strategies that we use. Yes, 3D simulations, and we do global uh, simulations, uh, and you're simulating a dynamical phase. Ideally, you would also simulate what happens before that and leads into that. Okay, so what, whatever, you know, what leads into common envelope, uh, although that's really hard to do just because it's so computationally demanding because the orbit, the orbital period is much larger at the beginning and the farther out in place, uh, the, you know, the farther, the, the greater the separation that you put it at initially, the longer it's going to take to get into the common envelope stage. So we started, we cheat a little bit and started closer. We start the companion really right on top of the, uh, like right next to the um, primary star, next to the giant star. And then post-dynamical, like we can only make the simulations go for so long until, you know, we have to stop because of computational time constraints and they don't end, they don't reject anything. And it's not just us, but other groups have the same issue. Okay, so, um, so sometimes, you know, so can we go farther all the way and, and finish the entire common envelope phase? Um, right now we can't, but eventually, ideally, we would be able to. Okay, some people, um, they also do 3D simulations, but not global simulations. So they'll do local simulations. Sometimes they're called the wind tunnel simulations where they have only the companion and they have this background envelope gas uh, from, you know, so they basically uh, simulate just uh, uh, a small cube inside the star, inside the giant star, 
uh, and they fix the Campania at the center and they shoot a wind through the side of the cube and uh, it simulates you know, the, the companion's motion through the envelope. And uh, because the main motion is the orbital motion, it's slowly moving radially inward. And then they calculate the forces, they can calculate the rotation, quantum the particle, et cetera. And uh, those are good as well. And they're less demanding, but they have their limitations as we will see. Then you can jump to 1D spherically symmetric simulations. These can be useful, particularly for low mass companions because they don't disturb the envelope as much. Also, the core of the giant star basically stays at the center, and the giant, the giant star doesn't get affected as much. And so the spherical symmetry is sort of preserved, and uh, these can be useful for studying, for example, planets, uh, planetary companions, or brown dwarf companions, but less so for you know similar mass binary companion uh, binary systems. And maybe the the late stages also, the very late stages, you get back some of that spherical symmetry. Um, as the two cores are now very deep inside this envelope. Um, their sort of a holy grail, like I mentioned, is these zero, zero, 0D time-dependent models, right? So we want very simple models. We don't have to worry about you know, spatial derivatives and so on, uh, but ideally time-dependent. But what we do have already, and what is used a lot in the population synthesis models, is time-independent uh, models. And basically, this energy formalism is the most common. So the whole idea behind this is just energy conservation. So you start out with a binary system, and it loses orbital energy, and that orbital energy gets transferred and goes into the binding energy of the envelope. So basically, it can unbind the envelope. But uh, so that this this formula just comes from a simple, uh, just from setting up that energy conservation. E b is the binding energy of the envelope, and this. Stuff on the right side comes from the change in the orbital energy. AF is the final separation. AI is the initial separation. M1 is the mass of the primary star. And M1C is the mass of its core. M2 is the mass of the companion. But alpha CE is an efficiency factor that's unknown. You know, because this process won't be 100% efficient. Why? Because you transfer energy to the envelope. But some of that energy that you transfer will be to gas that's already unbound. And so you're just giving it more energy than it needs to unbind. And so you're wasting energy in a sense because you're transferring stuff that's already escaped essentially, and you're not giving it the stuff that's still bound. So alpha CE will be less than one and it's sort of an unknown. We try to, people try to estimate it from observations, um, but it's kind of an unknown parameter. So let me go into the, the methods that we use for these global simulations. So we start um, in you know a fairly large box compared to the uh, compared to the size of the system. It's hard to see, but this is the primary star, and right next to it, to the right, is the companion. The core of the primary star is this purple dot. The companion is the red dot, and this is showing density. You can see that there's a huge dynamic range in, in the density, and there would be in the pressure, temperature, um, and in the scales, uh, you know, the density, scale, height, and so on. And so it, that's why it's so challenging to simulate this. And you, it's really a 3D problem. So it's hard to simulate it in 1D, like I mentioned. So these are the equations we solved, just the so-called Euler equations of hydrodynamics, um, but along with the Poisson equation. So you also have to account for all the gravitational interaction between the two cores, which we model as point particles, uh, between the cores and the gas, and between the gas and itself, self-gravity. And all of that is important, so you can't just neglect it, any one of those. And so we use this code called AstroBear. It's an adaptive mesh refinement um, Euler, Eulerian code. It's a Riemann solver, uh, which are, Riemann solvers are good at simulating shock waves. And um, it's high, highly parallelized. So we need to do this on pretty big machines. Uh, and this code was uh, developed uh, at the University of Rochester by you know, by this, this is one of my collaborators here, Jonathan Carol Nellemann. So I'll just show you briefly a movie of how this looks. This is one of our recent, uh, so this is the longest simulation I've done. So you'll see that it doesn't go to completion, but you're ejecting some of the envelope until the point where we just run out of time, computer time, and we have to stop it. But, uh, 
Um, okay, so there's this in spiral. It's very rapid. Uh, you can see the time, the top, it's counting the time in days. So this is uh, like a few months, uh, over 100 days, and it's about 100, over 100 orbits. So you can't you lose sight of the orbit because it's, it's at such a small uh, separation, but there's over 100 uh, orbits of the particles. And this is a slice through the orbital plane. So it would look different if you took a perpendicular slice, for example, but I'm showing you the orbital plane. Okay, so um, in this case, we simulated uh, two solar mass red giant branch star, along with a one solar mass companion. And this is the plot of the separation versus time. And this is for actually four different simulations. So I mentioned that we added physics uh, here and there in some of our simulations. So in one of them we're doing with a tabulated equation of states, so we're including ionization and recombination. So it's kind of more complicated. Um, and the one I just showed you, it's an ideal gas uh, equation of state uh, with gamma five thirds. Um, and you can see that there isn't actually much difference in terms of the orbital evolution. You have a pretty rapid in spiral at first, and then it slows down pretty drastically until you would almost say that it's not in spiraling at all at the end, but in fact it is, as the inset shows, uh, there's still a very uh, slow reduction with time um, in the separation. So yeah, I mean, we'd like to go further, but this is sort of as far as we can get at the moment. Uh, this is, I'm not going to go through all the curves here, what they are, but just pay attention to this green curve. This is showing the orbital energy of the particles, the core particles alone, that system. So basically their mutual uh, potential energy along with their kinetic energy. And you can see that it's still decreasing by the end of the simulation. It hasn't flattened out as much as the orbital separation, okay? just because, you know, it's just a, a, a way that you can see that this simulation has not stalled which is often the claim in the literature of the simulation stall, they have a real problem. We, st we still have in spiral, we still have energy being converted. So that energy is reducing and being converted to energy of the envelope, right? It's being transferred to the envelope. And so, um, you know, the it's not that the simulations get to a point where they just fail, it's that we just can't keep going because uh, at this point we don't have the resources. So another thing you can look at is the unbound mass okay? So now, how exact, how precisely we define unbound mass? It's slightly, it's somewhat arbitrary. So we can define it in different ways. I'm showing you one definition, which we think is the most reasonable. But in any case, uh, no matter how you define it, the story is kind of the same. Uh, actually, I'm showing a few different definitions. But pay attention to the solid lines. That that's the definition which is most reasonable because it it takes into account. Um, both the kinetic, the potential, and the thermal energy in the definition of unbound. So basically, if, all, if you add those all up and the energy density is greater than zero, um, then you call it unbound. And there's, there's a, a small caveat there is that we take, we're actually a little more conservative than that because we put a factor of two in front of uh, the potential energy terms involving interaction between the core and the gas the cores and the gas, because you have to include the half of the potential energy that's in the cores. So it's, there's a bit of a subtlety there, but it's important because if you're going to separate it out to infinity, you need to take into account all of the potential energy, not just half of it. But anyway, um, to make a long story short, what you see here in all three simulations, the blue, the red, and the yellow, the blue is the tabulated equation of state, the red is an ideal gas simulation where we had a pretty dense ambient medium surrounding the environment was pretty dense, so it had to expand into a fairly dense medium. And the yellow one, we uh, reduced the ambient density greatly. So it's basically expanding into uh, almost vacuum. All three of them, they show a mass unbinding rate at the, at the end of the simulation, but basically at the second, in the second half of the simulation, that's fairly constant in time. Right? The rate, the slope of this is pretty constant. So what you can do, and of course, we're talking, I should mention here that we've only unbound, maybe um, I'll go back there for a second. We've only unbound about 
0.4 solar masses, whereas the envelope is about 1.6 solar masses in mass. So, you know, we haven't even unbound um, you know, 25%, but you could extrapolate. And at that current rate, at the end of the simulation that we see of the M dot, uh, it will only take about two years to unbind the whole envelope. And interestingly, when you do the same kind of simulation, but for an AGB star, asymptotic giant branch star, which is much larger, but you use the same companion and the, use this, the same, basically the same primary star, but you just evolve it for longer in this 1D simulation. I didn't mention that, but you have to perform a 1D simulation using a code called MESA, which is the standard 1D uh, square phase symmetric simulation code for stars. To get your initial condition for this simulation, let's we evolve that, you get RGB and you put it into our simulation. You can evolve it further and get AGB, which is bigger, put it into the simulation. If you do that and you do the same simulation and you look at the mass unbinding rate, uh, you get exactly the same, uh, the, the time that you predict is exactly four times longer, or like basically four times longer, which is happens to be the same as the ratio of the orbital periods at the beginnings of, beginning of the simulation, which is maybe a coincidence, but maybe interesting also, because if if it's scalable between, you know, if you can just change the parameters of the system and scale the model, that would be uh, that would be nice, right? Okay, but the other thing you can do is you can look at the, remember that green curve that I showed you for the energy, the rate of energy, um, orbital energy variation of the particles. Um, you can use that to also extrapolate the simulation. And then you could compare the two answers that you get using M dot and using E dot. And when you do that, you can constrain alpha. So if you believe both those extrapolations, then you could actually come up with a value for this efficiency factor that I mentioned at the beginning. And this is important. Now, it's it, there's a bit of a range here because you know there's only you could only get you know so accurate. But um, but yeah, this is important for the population synthesis people who want to know desperately want to know what is this alpha, right? What is the value of this alpha? We know it has to be less than one, but why? Okay, so some questions this still leaves us with. Can we extrapolate in a more reliable way? Can we develop a simple time-dependent model? Can this model be generalized to all common envelope events? And the orbital evolution is ultimately governed by this drag force that I mentioned, this dynamical friction drag force. So we need to model it. So it, any model will start with the drag force. And so that's where we turn to next. How do we model the drag force? So the basic idea of the drag force, uh, when you're talking about dynamical friction drag, gravitational drag, is that you have this particle, right? In our case, this would be the companion, and it's moving to, towards the right. Um, and if it's moving through a uniform medium, just imagine the envelope around it is uh, uniform density, which it isn't, but let's just imagine that for, the, for a second. Then within a certain radius, we'll call that RA, an accretion radius, material will make it all the way, it will, its trajectory will be curved because of the gravity of the particle and it will um, collide at some point C and at this point C, it will be able to accrete. So if, it, if it's within this radius, it will actually be able to accrete onto the particle. And um, and in any case, uh, it will develop uh, an overdensity in this region behind the particle, and that will exert a drag. Okay, so basically, it's just grab your stuff is flowing in, it accumulates behind the particle. Why doesn't it, it accumulate directly on the particle? Because the particle is moving, right? So wherever it wants to go, the particle has gone away from there since that time, and so the, because of that delay, it accumulates behind the particle, and You've got more higher density behind the particle, you're going to feel an acceleration. You're going to feel the force. It's going to decelerate, right? It's going to cause the drag. And you can work out, uh, you know, you can work this out. And this is the expression uh, for the, the, the accretion radius. V infinity would be uh, the, the velocity of the material at infinity. So basically, the velocity of your particle through the medium. C infinity is the sound speed. Uh, M dot is the accretion rate, and BHL means Bondi Hoyle Littleton. So this is old stuff. This was done like almost 100 years ago now. Um, some of the papers are listed at the bottom, 
but it's been improved on over time. And this is the drag force that you get. It's the accretion rate times the infinity times a logarithm, which is, you know, that, that factor is hard to pin down, but of course it's a logarithm, so it's, it doesn't matter as much. Uh, it's not going to be varied by that much. And, but roughly speaking, you get a force of this order of magnitude, which we'll call F naught. Okay, and the extra thing that you can think about is if you have a density gradient, which we do in the envelope, there's a pretty strong density gradient, then you have to consider how the flow changes because of that density gradient, and that will affect the force. And uh, the, the material coming from this side, from underneath, basically, from closer to the, to the core of the giant star, will, you know, be, uh, will dominate, it'll have a higher density, and it will push, be able to push the other material coming from the top, and uh, you'll get an asymmetry there. And if you try to include that analytically, uh, you can go up to linear order, and this was done in 1952 by Dodd and McRae, and they came up with this um, modified formula, okay, where the accretion radius is replaced by this new expression. And the force gets multiplied by this, the, the square of the ratio. The thing is that when we compare these analytical formulae to what we get from the simulation, what we actually measure from the simulation, it kind of works okay near the beginning. Now, at the very beginning, you know, we're, we're right at the edge, so we don't expect it to work perfectly. But at a certain point, around 10 days, um, af around the time of the initial. Uh, the first peri um, periastron passage, okay, where they get the, the closest approach because um, it's an eccentric orbit. That's why you see these oscillations in the separation. Around that time, you're within maybe a factor of two. So you're sort of, okay, maybe the, the theories are not too bad. And, you know, the, this is not really the last word on the theory also. There's, you know, other people have improved it slightly. So you're not too bad. But later on, you can be a factor of 20. So there's something wrong. It doesn't work. So we explored this in a paper in 2019. And then we thought, well, okay, maybe we just, maybe we're not including everything we need to include. So what if you include that logarithmic factor? Does that help? So we looked at that. No, it doesn't. What if you estimate all these, instead of using uh, the, the values of this V infinity, C infinity, et cetera, rho infinity from the, from the initial envelope profile to compute this analytical force, what if you use try to estimate it from the simulation itself? Still doesn't really help. Okay. Um, what if you use this more recent uh, paper, which improved the theory for Mach numbers less than one? Uh, it, you still can get it to work. Okay. So no matter what we did, if, even if you um, think, well, maybe it's not dynamical first and drag after all. Maybe it's hydrodynamic drag because in the simulations, these cores, which are point particles, that they accumulate kind of a hydrostatic atmosphere of their own. Uh, so the whole thing moves together. You can think of it that there must be a hydrodynamic drag associated with that. And we tried that formula and so on, but it, nothing really worked. You, there is no theory that works. Okay, so it's not understood. We can measure the drag force. We know it's very small, but why? Okay, so what one thing people try is they do these local simulations, like I mentioned, these wind tunnel simulations to simulate the flow around the companion. And they can have a density gradient in these simulations. They could also have, you know, realistic gravitational force um, due to the core, the, the core of the giant star, which would be down here somewhere, like way down. And as this thing moves in, um, you know, but everything is playing parallel. So there are certain limitations. But this has been done, and then they calculate the drag force from the simulation, and then you can integrate it, right? You can integrate the orbital energy, and basically on the left side is the change in orbital energy, and on the right side is the um, the rate of change, you know, from the drag force, from the drag, right? The energy dissipation, and you can uh, compute the orbital separation as a function of time. The problem is that this doesn't really work because uh, when you get close enough, the effect of the flow, uh, the effect on the flow of the giant star core is not captured properly. And I'll show you some evidence for that. 
If you look at another simulation that we did, where we have a four times less massive companion, the disparity between the simulation and the theory is not quite as bad, but um, so as you, that's sort of expected, as you reduce the, the companion mass, then you retain a lot more, I mean, the, the, the flow is not as affected as much by the companion itself. So the theory should work better. But if you compare our results to what you would get from a fitting formula for the drag force based on one of these local simulations, okay, you get remarkable agreement at the beginning, and then you get complete disagreement, the green line compared to the black line. Right? And uh, you can ask, is this, maybe this is just a coincidence, but if you compare this, the two simulations, uh, the region around the companion, at this particular time, at a time where we just fortuitously were able to match the parameters. Okay, so their, their um, density gradient was the same as ours uh, at that particular time, just lucky. But I found a time where the parameters matched well. And then I went in and, and plotted the same thing as they plotted. So this is what I plotted in, my, in our simulation. This is the flow around the companion. So at the center, you'll see the companion. This is the softening radius. So basically below that softening radius, you have to soften the gravity. You have to reduce the gravity to, um, you know, it can't, obviously the gravity can't go to infinity. It's one over R squared, but you uh, reduce it to a constant at the center. So you can trust what's outside of that, that sphere. You can see the flow uh, velocity is the vectors and the density. And here on the bottom is the Mach number. When you compare to these local simulations, similar parameters, and I, I should have used the same color bar on the top. I didn't use exactly the same one, but uh, it's very similar. Okay, so maybe the students would be like, yeah, I see some difference. But I mean, for an astrophysicist, this is like remarkable, right? So I was like, okay, so something works. So, but although they agree, in detail, uh, at the beginning, they completely disagree at the end. And, and some of that is down to the parameters changing a little bit, but it's more than that. It's the influence of the core, right? Because your separation is getting much smaller, and now you really need to include both particles. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to argue for that a bit more. So if we look at our simulation at two different times, uh, shown by these green uh, vertical lines, you can see the difference, okay? So at early times, um, I'm showing four panels here. The first one, the first two are at the same scale. The last two are zoomed in. But on the left, you see the density. You see that it's highly asymmetric. So the companion here is moving towards the left. The RGB core is moving towards the right. They're encircling each other. They're in an orbit. And um, you can see that all of the material, like most of the material is piled up behind the secondary. So you get this dynamical friction effect, right? This is what we talked about before, this BHL theory. And yeah, the, the, the drag force uh, that's predicted from that theory shouldn't be too bad. And it is, it wasn't, right? It was within a factor of two or so uh, near the beginning. You can see it here if you plot the force density. Um, because we to compare the theory and the simulation, we have to put ourselves in the reference frame of the core of the giant star. And so the, the drag on the core of the giant star also matters, actually. So that's why the, the plot is a bit uh, complicated. But regions where you see the solid contours are regions that will produce a drag, and regions uh, where you see a dash contour will produce a thrust. But you can see that there's enough asymmetry that you're obviously going to get a drag here. The drag will be larger than the thrust, so it will win out. And the black line here shows you uh, the direction of the force exerted on the companion by the gas. Most of it is towards the center where the gas is concentrated because after all, it's still the original star uh, was much denser towards the center, but the, there will be a component in the phi direction basically um, that will, that, that's the drag, right? So whatever component, uh, the horizontal component in this graph, that's the drag. Um, and then here you see that the, this is the density compared to the initial density of the envelope. It's very enhanced um, at this point in the simulation. And then the Mach number has this pattern. But if we now look at the late time evolution, the flow structure at late times, it's completely different. 
clearly the, the core of the primary is greatly affecting the flow and you develop this nice symmetry, kind of this pinwheel pattern starting to look like a galaxy, right? Um, and uh, if you look at the force density, it's much more symmetric as well. So the companion is experiencing a drag still, but it's also experiencing a thrust that almost balances the drag. So the net force that it experienced still a drag because this vector here, this black vector, uh, the component, the horizontal component is still towards the right. So it's still a drag, but it's that component is actually smaller than it was at the beginning, even though the total force experienced by the companion from the gas is much larger because it's much closer to the center of the giant star. Um, the drag is actually much weaker. And you know, you you get the density enhancements much lower. And look at the Mach number. Uh, not only is the pattern different, but you start to see a hint of turbulence, right? It's a very different regime. And what we want to do ultimately is understand this late regime. If we can do that, we can understand common envelope evolution and hopefully predict what would happen at late times and ultimately uh, how it ends. So when does the transition happen between these two regimes? So what you can do is you can plot the separation, which we've plotted in black here, the particle separation. And then you could plot some other length scales and try to see like which one sort of predicts where the regime transitions from one to the other. And the maximum drag force is shown by this, the time of the maximum drag force is shown by this vertical line. And you see that the green and the magenta lines kind of approach the separation at around this time. They start small, but then they approach the separation. So the, the magenta is the accretion radius from that dodd mccray uh, theory that included the density gradient, right? And the green line is simply the density scale height in the envelope, in the original envelope, okay? So I'm not even considering like how it gets affected by the companion and the interaction, but just the original envelope. So that gives you a hint. If you look at the other simulation with Q18, so that just means the companion was four times uh, smaller in mass, then it's only the green line seems to coincide with the maximum uh, drag force. So perhaps, although this is not conclusive evidence, and we, we could look, we did one more simulation, it's the same sort of thing that you can see, that when this, uh, the scale height becomes comparable to the separation of the particles, then the drag force drops drastically and uh, retains this much smaller value uh, for the rest of the simulation. So this is not a final answer, but it gives you a hint of what might be involved. So the density gradient seems to be important. So basically, in summary, there's two phases, plunge-in, what we call plunge-in, and then the slow spiraling phase. These phases are distinguished by phase two, displaying a greater degree of symmetry, as I showed. Um, the transition seems to happen when the separation is of order the density gradient, uh, the density scale height. And phase two cannot be modeled using existing theory or local simulations. So how do we do that? Right? So that was the question that we asked ourselves. And uh, we said, let's look at the literature because there, had, there is other theory on this. Um, and there has been some good work done. A lot of it has been done out of Mexico for some reason. Um, but it's still sort of linear perturbation theory. And if the masses are high and they really perturb the envelope strongly, that theory is not as useful. What we did find that could be useful was some work that was done not on stars, but on supermassive black holes. So binary supermassive black holes um, from two galaxies that merge. It's a very analogous uh, process that happens. So they're surrounded by a gaseous medium. They feel a drag force, dynamical friction. They will inspire. And uh, here they're not very concerned about ejecting the gas. What they're more concerned about is when do they inspire enough so that the gravitational radiation can take over and dominate. But nevertheless, this part of the this part of the, the the physics is similar, and what they did in this paper from 2004 
is they said, well, what, what we see in the simulations is we see that there's kind of an ellipsoidal shaped um, bulge or mass distribution around the two particles. And this ellipsoid is phase shifted from the line that joins the particles by some fairly small angle, let's call it phi. And because of that phase shift, it, is, it exerts a drag on the system. So this is actually all rotating together. So it's very different from the DHL theory where you had to have relative motion between the gas and the particles. Here, everything is co-rotating together. And this means some people believe that, you know, you have a real problem. But no, they say, no, it's rotating together. But because of this phase shift, you still have a drag. And they used a simple model where they took this ellipsoid to have constant density, which of course it doesn't, especially in the common envelope case, it doesn't have constant density at all. It'd be denser near the center. Um, and it's not a perfect ellipsoid either. And they took, uh, not only that, but they took a prolate sphere. So they assumed that two of the axes of the ellipsoid are equal. And they assumed just, I think, a two to one ratio for the, for the two remaining uh, scales. But whatever they did, no matter how simple they made it, they got very good agreement. This is a log plot. So it's more, maybe a little more, looks a little more impressive than it really is. But if it's plotting the binary separation versus time, the red one is their low resolution run. Don't worry about that. But the green one was their high resolution run. And the black dots are the model prediction. Like it's, you look at this and it's like, it's hard to even believe that this was it. So we said, okay, well, let's just try it for common envelope. Why not? So, um, so there was a student, an MSc student who joined me recently, and we've been working on this. We don't have a final answer yet, but first question we asked is, how far out do you have to go from the cores to capture all of the drag? Because we can measure the drag from, all, from the entire simulation box. Um, so we can just test that, right? So you can go to the whole simulation box, or you can go to a certain radius, and measure it, and then go to a bit bigger radius, et cetera, until you find that they're roughly equal, that it's roughly equal to the effect from the whole simulation box. So in other words, like the torque is dominated by some region around the cores, but how big does that region need to be? Okay, so we found that if your density, the ratio of your density out to which you go compared to the maximum density in the simulation is of order 10 to the minus two or 10 to the minus three, then that accounts for pretty much all of the drag. Okay, so that's about the size of the ellipsoid that we need, okay? Next question is, okay, let's choose a particular uh, ratio of densities and actually measure this for one, uh, for the entire simulation. So here we have, and I, what I didn't mention is that that Scala work, it assumes that the mass of the two black holes was equal. That's an important point, right? So it doesn't work for unequal mass. So I had to run a simulation with equal core mass. So the core of the RGB, was the same as same mass as the companion. Okay, so that we're looking at only that case for now. But anyway, we find that for for the density ratio to be, if it's 0.6%, then it pretty well reproduces the drag force. Um, that's this horizontal black line. So it pretty well reproduces that uh, after a time of about 150 days in the simulation. So but we're only interested in late time, so that's okay. All right, so Here's a little movie that he did showing these are the contours of density. And this is an ellipsoid that he fit in the, in the orbital plane to the yellow contour, essentially. Okay, And it's not too bad a fit. And you can see how the parameters of the ellipsoid, and again, it's a spheroid. Oh, no, in this case, it's just an ellipsoid. So he let the three axes be different. But you can see how, um, now we kept the separation fixed in this movie. Okay, So the separation is fixed. Uh, it's not really fixed. Obviously, it's decreasing. And their oscillations, but it's basically just to show you, uh, we've kept it fixed here for presentational purposes. And if I run the movie, first of all, is an ellipsoid a reasonable fit? It seems to be not too bad, right? It's a bit hard to see the contour, but it's not a terrible fit. If you go to the perpendicular plane, it's again, I'm not showing that, but it's again, not a terrible fit. So an ellipsoid, just the idea of fitting an ellipsoid isn't doesn't seem terrible at the outset. And are the parameters of the ellipsoid changed? Because in that Scala model, they used everything, they made everything constant. It was very, very small. You can see oscillations. You can see the ellipsoid is, or the ellipse is changing in size. 
but not drastic. Is the angle changing? Right, that, that phase shift? Yes, it's changing, but again, not drastic. Okay, so perhaps we can go further with this. Perhaps it's useful. So it turns out that for such a simple uh, model, you can calculate the potential. It was actually done in 1879 by Lamb. And uh, it's also in Chandrasekhar's book and so on. So we had a history lesson, but it's a big long expression. But if you make the assumptions that we're making here, constant density and, uh, well, actually even with the constant density, it's a long expression, but we make some extra assumptions here, uh, like a prolate, prolate sphere, right? So two of the axes that are equal. Um, also we're, you know, we're in the orbital, the, it's, it's coplanar, the, the ellipsoid is oriented with, along with the, in, in the orbital plane, it's just like the major axis is in the orbital plane, but it's only that it's phase shift. And so in this special case, the torque expression that you get becomes very simple. Um, and it's partly for this, uh, partly the reason is for the same reason that if the Earth's mass was just concentrated in the shell at the surface, there would be no change for the gravity, right? So if you change the radial distribution of the uh, mass inside this ellipsoid, it doesn't really matter much. That's why, that's essentially why this model actually works. Okay? Um, and so anyway, the E is the eccentricity here. And it's just these few expressions, C is B equals B. That just means the two axes are the same. It's a prolate spheroid. And what you, uh, what we did first is, uh, okay, so we kept this 0.6% that I mentioned. And we made rho bar, so the average density equal to that. Uh, we just took, we just measured, we calculated the average density inside that uh, contour. And then we took the rate axis ratio from the simulation itself. So we fit the ellipsoid and took the axis ratio um, at every frame, we allowed it to vary. And we allowed delta phi or that phi angle to vary as well. And when you do that, you can reproduce the torque very accurately. I mean, it's there's no fudge factor in here. We just the green is from measured from the simulation, and the black is the model. So this was like surprising. I, I first we did something wrong, and it was off by a factor of 100. I said, oh, well, okay, a factor of 100. Let me put in some fudge factor. And then he corrected it, and all of a sudden it was almost perfect. So I was like, okay, so it works uh, surprisingly well. What if we make everything constant? because that's what Escala did. And that's where the model really becomes useful because you don't want these parameters that you have to take from the simulation. I mean, what's the point? So what we did is we took an average value and I'm not going to show you, but they do vary a little bit, these axis ratios. But if you take the average value, um, it's about two thirds. And you take the average value of the angle, it's about 15 degrees. And it's similar, you know, a bit different from what Escala got. But that's fine, different system and so on. And you still get a reasonable, um, you know, reasonable agreement. So this is basically where we are right now. And uh, the next thing we have to do actually is relate to sort of um, close the system of equations. We have to relate this average density to the separation itself. And in Escala, what they did is they found that it's roughly proportional to a to the minus two. And I put a, a bar there because of the eccentricity in the orbit, there's these oscillations you can average over one period, right? Um, but they found this roughly inverse squared relation, uh, relationship and we find like 2.5, okay? So it's close. Um, so if we put that in and we integrate, we should be able to get a graph of the separation versus time from the model and then we can compare it to the simulation. So that's something that he's working on now. But ultimately, we have to generalize this to the case of unequal masses, which is like pretty much all the cases, right? So it's not obvious how to do that, but we're thinking about it. Okay, so um, just briefly before I end, uh, I wanted to mention that you know this is not the whole story. Obviously, there. Are, if you had other speakers, they might say different things. They might disagree with some aspects. So alternative views. So one, um, people claim that this stimulation stall that you know they don't keep reducing in separation because there's something wrong. In our case, we find that they do keep reducing uh, their separation with time. But in some simulations, they say that it's not reducing at all anymore at the end of their simulation. And their simulation can go much longer than ours. 
But our results suggest that um, the Inspiral in other simulations is either not completely stalled or it's stalled due to lack of numerical resolution. So I'm not saying it's it's a closed and closed case, but this is what um, our results suggest. Um, but yes, they're right that there are many other effects that we've neglected. We've studied some of those effects, and my guess, and I'll just it's just a guess at this point, is that they're all of order 10%. They're not going to drastically change things. Um, first is recombination energy release. So ionization recombination, if you include that, as the envelope expands, it will cool down, material will ions will recombine with electrons, and you will release energy in that process. That energy goes into the envelope and helps it to eject. One of the this is for sure important at some level, but it will not help to explain observations that usually find that the final separation that we see in these post CE systems is smaller than what simulations tend to be. Doing. Because if anything, if you're adding more energy, then you'll eject the envelope sooner and your separations will end up being larger. So yes, this is important, but exactly how it affects the process is not yet well understood. We have a paper that we just submitted. There's also accretion and onto the companion from the envelope and the jet feedback that can be associated with this. Again, we think this could be important, but probably only for neutron stars and black hole companions. Uh, we have a paper recently in 2022 where we studied this for main sequence and white dwarf companions. Again, it could be a 10% effect for white dwarf companions but it's hard to get it to be more important than that. And it won't dominate the envelope uh, ejection, at least for those types of companions. And then there's still always the question in the back of our minds, what about turbulence, what about convection? And it's really hard to model those in the simulation. There's been some work done by my colleagues in Rochester, but for low mass uh, companions. And finally, the second alternative view is that yes, the stalling um, the stalling is real, but I mean, the inner spiral slows drastically, and you know you have to go to a different regime. Like you, you, you can't use simulations anymore because now radiation becomes important. Um, everything happens on the thermal time scale, Kelvin-Helmholtz time scale. So you're going to have cooling from the surface. So you have this energy injection from the pores in spiral, in spiral. So that's still there, but it doesn't help to eject the envelope because all of that energy just radiates at the surface. So how do you, but then you have to ask, okay, but then how do you eject the envelope? And there's been some work using 1D models that suggest that you can get um, pulsations from dynamical instabilities that will ultimately eject the envelope over a longer time scale. So it could be that you enter a very different regime and sometimes this is called the self-regulated phase. Um, but again, like our extrapolations of our simulations suggest that the common envelope phase may be much shorter, but it may be only 10 years long or even around a year long, depending on the system. In which case it's unlikely, it seems unlikely that the self-regulated phase would ever actually occur, but it's still very much an open question. And we have to run the simulations for longer. Okay, so to conclude, um, progress has been made in simulating common envelope evolution, but simple time-dependent models are still needed. Models based on the bondi hoyle littleton formalism and modified versions thereof, or these local wind tunnel simulations that I mentioned, are inadequate because the assumptions on which they rely break down after the initial plunge phase, when the separation gets too small and comparable to the scale height. We end up with a cores and gas that are co-rotating with each other and a high degree of symmetry in the flow, but there's still a small drag force. This drag force is reduced, but it's still there. And there was, interestingly, there was some recent work um, on these lines by, in this paper here. Even so, extrapolation suggests that the CE phase is still quite short. Remember that observations don't really constrain it to be necessarily any shorter than a thousand years or 10,000 years. And the key to modeling the evolution is to model the post-plunge drag force. 
And finally, um, this Escala model may, still tentative, but may be a good starting point. So thank you very much.